We're here tonight to discuss Why Read Comics, a lively discussion of how comic books have um, interacted with our lives as artists and as makers and as educators and as people. Um, this is all a tie-in to uh, Google's Literacy Month um, initiative that they're going they're doing through the National Education Association. So this is gonna, this is going to be really fun. Um, so like I said, my name is Patrick Garrick. I am an art teacher as well as a artist um, at Little Fish Comic Book Studio in San Diego, California. Alonzo. Um, I'm Patrick's partner, Alonzo Nunez. Um, I graduated from the School of Visual Arts in New York in 2008. Um, I've been working as a freelancer since, and uh, me and Patrick started Little Fish Comic Book Studio um, exactly one year ago. Uh, Ginger? Oh, we can't hear you, Ginger. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ginger Ludden. Um, I'm a freelance graphic designer, illustrator. Um, I work on a webcomic called The Brothers Grant, and I'm in Indianapolis. Lee? Hi, I'm Lee Shrillis. I'm the artist for the webcomic Little Guardians. I'm also a graphic designer and illustrator working in Indianapolis. Hi, my name is Mark Litke. Um, I live in Richmond, Virginia. I work at uh, VCU Arts, where I make websites, and I also do the webcomic 2816 Monument. Hi, my name is Meg Gandy. Um, I am the artist for Godsend. It's a webcomic. I do lots of webcomics, and comics is pretty much all I do. Hey, everybody. I'm Michael Bitts. I live in New York, and I run the nonprofit organization EdPath. And one of our programs is called the Comic Book Project, where we help young people write and design and publish original comic books. Hey everybody, I'm Shane Houghton. I am a comic book writer. I created Reed Gunther, a comic about a bear riding cowboy with my brother. And uh, I also have written for The Simpsons and Peanuts and Adventure Time, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. Cool. Um, so when we when we were brainstorming for what this this whole panel could be about, uh, we had talked. Uh, the panelists and I had talked a lot about this whole idea of like, like we're all in different ends of the spectrum of comics. A couple of us are educators. A couple of us are artists. Some of us are both, and and some of us are writers, and some of us are just visual artists. And and I think that. Um, whatever it came from, when I was talking uh, with Google and I was talking with all the panelists, there was this idea of like, it all started somewhere. It all started with us being really into comics. And I always think it's funny because when I'm talking to people who don't read comics, they're like, well, how did you start reading comics? And I'm like, I don't remember when I didn't read comics. So it's kind of a hard thing for me to be like, it was this, this point in time. Um, I wanted to start uh, with some panelists kind of sharing out where they started, uh, what inspired them, and what inspires them currently, or, you know, a mixture of everything. Uh, so I'd like to hear from, um, let's go with uh, the order we went in <laughs> for the introductions. So let's go with Alonzo first. I'll go last because I'm already going to be talking a lot. So. <laughs> Um, all right, let me let me see if I can get the screen share going, thing going. Um, this is probably the the first comic that kind of uh, kicked me off on on my comic reading habits. This is Amazing Spider-Man number three hundred and fifty. Um, I picked it up from the San Diego International Airport <laughs> in nineteen ninety one. Um, Eric Larson, uh, David Michelinie wrote it. Um, just a kind of classic Marvel, you know, Doctor Doom. Uh, Spider-Man yarn, but I was I was hooked from that moment. Um, my next big kind of inspiring comic was probably um, Understanding Comics, um, which I'm sure you know speaks to a lot of people here. Um, this was one of the pages that blew my mind um, among many. Um, this is Scott McCloud's Pyramid on on, on art, um, where you can fit any art style and artist um, into it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, that really spoke to me in the sense of understanding, <laughs> understanding comics and comic art and um, being incredibly conscious about what I wanted to do with my art um, and where I wanted to go with it. Um, and the last book um, that's an uh, inspiration to me is probably um, this book. This is uh, one of the Mobius books. 
Um, Mobius is a, a French artist, died last year. Um, he is um, incredibly unique, um, and I think for me, his unique vision kind of inspired me to kind of just follow my own kind of route um, and direction for um, what I wanted to do with art. I feel like he broke every boundary that there possibly was, and he continues to be an inspiration to me. Um, yeah, that's that's me. Um, okay, Ginger, do you want to go next? All right. Uh, well, I was trying to think back on what it was like for me to get into comics, and um, I don't know how I'm going to do this in two minutes, so I'm going to try to give you the quick story. Is that uh, I grew up on a small island that was just developing um, about in the 80s, and um, there were no libraries or anything, but then there was a lot of um, Japanese hotels, and they would bring in... Or they would bring in um, a bunch of people from Japan to work in these hotels, and they had libraries. So I would actually go in there and pick up all these manga that I couldn't read or understand. And that's how I got into comics, is that I was just flipping through these books. And um, a bunch of other stuff happens getting that I got an X-Men cartoon and everything, but um, eventually I ended up moving out of the country. And then I came across a comic book store in the Philippines, and there was... Let me pull this up. <laughs> There was this guy. Oh. So I came across Mike Waringo's art, and I just fell in love with comics at that point. If I saw something that he was drawing, oh, gee, how do I do this? <laughs> if I saw something that he was drawing, then I would just go for it. <laughs> so that's kind of my story. Um. Wait, so I guess yeah. Minas, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I mean, I'd say my earliest influence is uh, tracing Garfield comic strips out of the books that my uh, my mom had owned. She had, like, a couple Garfield collections that were actually signed by Jim Davis, and those are my first comics that I read. And then, you know, got into um, Calvin and Hobbes and Farside uh, as far as newspaper strips go. And then... You know, a uh, child of the 80s, so I got into X-Men uh, comics that I actually bought at gas stations when we were on road trips. And uh, that was back when they had spinner racks and <laughs> grocery stores. And so I got a lot of off-brand and weird. I got some, like, Marvel UK stuff that I didn't know. I didn't know what the difference was. I was a kid. Um, but then uh, I'd have to see my... And I, I couldn't really find specific images for those, but I did find some of my current inspiration for creating comics... Um, just let me make sure it's pulled up on my desktop, and I'll do the screen share. Uh, desktop. Here we go. Just a second. Oh, it's sharing my desktop now. Okay. So I have um, Amulet uh, by Kazu Kibuishi. He's one uh, fantastic young adult uh, graphic novel artist um, collection going right now. And uh, awesome. So I can just flip through these. Bone, obviously, Jeff Smith, huge influence. Mouse Guard, David Peterson. Um, these are tend to be young adult. Um, whoop, whoops. <laughs> uh, let me pull it back up. Um, Nausicaa, Hayao Miyazaki, and Studio Ghibli. Uh, fantastic influences. Uh, my stuff. <laughs> I was told that we could share our own work. Um, uh, I'll just flip, those, th flip through those on the screen real quick. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, that's what's got me going right now. So um, I'll kind of go back a little bit further, I guess. Uh, when I was a kid, I was super ADHD. Um, I was never really diagnosed, so I never went on any medication. But as a result, reading uh, typical books was a, a really big struggle for me. I never had the patience for it. Um, but I was also super obsessed with drawing all the time. I've got uh, boxes and boxes of drawings that I did as a kid up in the attic. Um, so when I found comics, which was the stuff in the Sunday papers, it was this just beautiful mix between images that I was hopelessly obsessed with and the words that I always struggled with. Um, but when you put them together, I couldn't stop reading them. So um, I was always a big fan of uh, Gary Larson, uh, Bloom County, which is another one. I don't know if you can see, but these edges are just torn to shreds from years of reading these things. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, of course, has, I think for all of us has been a huge, huge influence. 
Um, loved reading that stuff as a kid. Um, so one of the things though with being ADHD was uh, I had a lot of trouble in school. Um, I was never really able to focus on things and kind of get the grades that I, I probably could have gotten. I think I've always had the smarts, but being able to sit down and focus on this stuff was difficult. Um, but wanting to draw these comics and forcing myself to do it um, kind of in a way sort of turned my life around. Um, I think comics, as anyone who's ever tried to make one will tell you, is it's no small endeavor. It takes uh, a ton of patience, a ton of commitment, and a ton of attention to detail. Um, and my struggle to to hone that craft has kind of helped me to get over the inability to focus on long-term things and to kind of see the reward that comes after all the work. Um, so it was through drawing comics that I ended up deciding that I was going to just drop what I was doing and go to art school. Um, my wife had my back and we just picked up stakes from Minnesota and moved to Richmond. I went to VCU Arts, uh, ended up getting into graphic design, which seemed uh, to be the best thing for comics because I was really more interested in the, the design of everything. Um, specifically, uh, Chris Ware, his stuff just, my mind was just blew up when I saw his work. Um, but it's through all of that and through the struggle to make this stuff that I learned how to focus, that I got through school, ended up doing really well in school since it was now focused on art. Um, and without any of that, I never would have found graphic design and web development, which is the current job that I have and love. And uh, thank you, comics. They, uh, they helped me out a lot. So, Meg, you're up next. Uh, I came at comics sort of sideways. Uh, I grew up during the 90s, which, I mean, a lot of you guys are apparently fans of 90s cape comics, but I was not. Um, what I had when I was little was, uh, oh, that's, that's reflecting. Um, illustrated books, really gorgeous illustrated books. So I always knew that I wanted to tell stories with pictures. Um, it's just the notion of this changed over time. When I was a little kid, I thought that would be illustrated kids' books. As I got older, um, started to be exposed to different things, I thought it would be animation. The first comic that I encountered that I thought would be something like what I'd want to do was Bone, which was mentioned previously. Um, it was being published at the time in a Disney magazine, but I guess it got too serious because they canceled it. And I was like, oh, well, I guess comics like that aren't allowed to exist. Um, then in high school, I encountered, you know, manga, but I, I obviously didn't think I was going to Japan to draw comics. That was not a thing that seemed feasible. Um, and then I went to college for animation, and there was this fantastic local comic shop. Um, uh, and it had it had the most wonderful books in it. Oh, let's see. It had Finder um, by Carla Speed McNeil, which is science fiction and fantastic. It's gorgeous. Uh, it had Sandman, which was another really peculiar, strange thing that I'd never seen before. It just had all these books that I was like, yeah. Yeah, actually, I would like to do that. That is gorgeous. Um, so that's that's where I came from. Great, uh, Michael. Share a little bit about yourself. Okay, and, uh, well, your journey. Absolutely. Um, I come to the comics world from a different space than some of the other folks here, and it's a pleasure to be here to share my background with everybody. Uh, I'm a literacy educator and a youth advocate, and I started this program called the Comic Book Project in 2001, and the very simple concept of helping young people have a voice in reading and writing, and it's interesting to hear Mark you know, talk about his, pro his struggles in school and how comics sort of saved him. And so we've been doing the same with helping kids create comics in class and after school and in libraries, and I thought maybe I could just share... Um, just a few of the comics and kids who are creating comics. Um, hopefully you can see this. Uh, these are some of the middle schoolers that we work with. And the idea for them to be able to um, share, share their work, be published artists and authors, and with their families really have um, something to celebrate 
in their reading and writing. And to enter that really unique world of published authorship, I think is just such a fantastic motivational tool for young people. And the range of work that kids create in the comic book project is from the very simple, um, always constructed around narrative, always based around character, um, obviously um, a lot of drawing and artistry going into these works, but also thinking about the social themes and the social development that goes into these kinds of comics, um, thinking about the kind of message that you want to say and the kind of story that you want to tell. And so for some kids, the project can be a really amazing showcase for their dynamic work. What we're seeing on screen right now is some work from some middle schoolers in Brooklyn. So if you look at the character design and the perspective and the space. Your screen's not shared, Michael. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no. Try it again. So, um, oh, there you go. All right, great. Okay. So I was just uh, pointing out um, some really dynamic work from some students compared with some very simple work. And for us, the, the goal is creativity. It's not so much about art skills per se, but it's really about telling your story and, and sharing who you are. Uh, sorry. Uh, Michael, you're sharing your, uh, your email. <laughs> sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to have to be showing that to everybody. Yeah, I'll stop screen show now. All right. All right. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It happens. I was really, I've been interested in your work for a very long time, Michael, because of uh, uh, just how spread out you are in the world and how many people you're influencing through the, the comic project, so. Cool. Um, and last but not, well, actually, I'm last, but Shane, <laughs> you want to go second to last? But Yes, not, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I, uh, I'm a writer now, and it's, pretty much a miracle because uh, as a kid I hated reading, I hated writing, I liked drawing, but uh, I don't know how I even got to the point where I'm writing comics. Um, I started by reading a lot of Calvin and Hobbes and Sunday you know, morning comics, Garfield, uh, all sorts of stuff, and one day I was waiting to pick up my younger brother, who I now work with. Uh, at, he was at a pizza party, and I was with my mom, and we stopped by this Kmart, and they used to have comics. And the first comic I picked up was the Sonic the Hedgehog number six, which is the worst comic book because it not only is it a comic book based off of a video game, this specific issue was just an advertisement for this new Sonic game called Sonic Spinball, which is like, pinball. So like how does that even work as a comic book? All they did was like go through, they like showcased each level and it was, it's the worst comic book I've ever read. But that's, there was something about the medium of comics and uh, learning just the pictures and the words together that it kept me going forward. And then I read this Spider-Man book, which is also probably the worst Spider-Man book I've ever read about this the villain called Humbug and he uh, uses bug he tape records bug noises and plays them back as a weapon to Spider-Man. I don't know. It's ridiculous. It's I don't know how that works. Somehow, all that ended up with me uh, creating and writing my own comic book uh, that my younger brother now draws called Reed Gunther. Um, it's hopefully way more fun than any of those books. Uh, but I kind of imagine it like when you start drawing or start anything, the first things you do are terrible. You know, it's just inherently how it works. But if it's something, if you're destined to be this great artist, even your earliest work is going to be, like, interesting in some sort because of the progression. And so I think that's why I really do, I love those comic books because of how terrible they are, but yet they totally hooked me into this genre and uh, opened my world to a whole uh, line of new ways to tell stories. And, and that's why I am fascinated with comic books. All right. So um, I'm from the woods in New Hampshire, uh, pretty deep in there. Um, I came from a town of about 5,000 people and an hour and a half from any kind of uh, city type place. So my earliest like connections to comic books before like 
I even understood like how to uh, uh, identify what one was, was Newsweek. We used to get the political cartoons in the Newsweek section. I think I was five years old and I didn't even know what any of those were about, but I was like, I know I want to create those. And um, my mom was an art teacher and she really inspired me. Um, I don't know if you guys remember these ones at all, but uh, I was going to go through a couple of my favorite little examples. of This was, I don't consider this a comic book per se, but I don't know if you guys remember um, the great illustrated classics of, uh, like, uh, uh, from childhood, they would they would translate uh, Dickens and all of these famous, Edgar Allan Poe, all, all of the famous authors, but each page would have an image. And it was really what get, got me into reading because I loved looking at the pictures um, next to the prose. And these, I wouldn't consider this, like, um, comics per se, <laughs> but I would consider them, like, a great stepping stone from, like, uh, for they were for me anyway. Um, when I was 14, I read Watchmen, which is incredibly violent and graphic. But um, I, I actually read this four years ago with my graphic novel project group um, when they were 13 and 14. As freshmen in high school, we got permission slips signed, and I read this with about 13 kids before the movie came out, which we were all disappointed when the movie came out because we were really looking forward to it. Um, but the uh, <laughs> the the Watchmen comic, when I read it when I was 14. Uh, like blew my mind like as far as like I don't re I, I read it and I got to the end and it was like I have no idea what just happened but something really cool happened and now I have to read it five more times like that was kind of my like uh, my, my first foray into being like that moment where I'm like I know I need to create comic books now um, and then lately my inspirations for American Boom the comic I work on with Alonzo have been um uh, Mark Wade and uh, Paolo Rivera um, were, did this, uh, the Daredevil Volume 3. Um, and specifically, this artwork is like phenomenal because you get into this, um, this kind of use of graphic storytelling that, that brings in audio visual, like without breaking that that wall of like there is no audio, but when, when the bird here like flaps, and it shows the flap, like that's pretty intense. One of my other favorite comics of like all, all, all time at this point is uh, Scott Pilgrim. Um, and I read this for the first time at the uh, Center for Cartoon Studies when I was doing their summer course. Um, and this is the colored version of it. This page in particular is really amazing to me because the author Brian Lee O'Malley actually includes um, uh, like line notes for the song that they're playing in this scene so you can go I think it even says go home and go home and play this um, this this song at home and it has like the where the the key changes are and everything and it's just one of for me it's an inspirational comic because it really pushes the boundaries and it's really new it's not like an old 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 comic it's one of these comics that found a way to push the boundaries because there's a lot more boundaries to push in comics um, so yeah those are those are mine, and I and I knew other people would share Calvin and Hobbes, so I, would, I didn't share Calvin and Hobbes with that. It's a really important comic. Um, Bill Watterson is probably one of the most important uh, uh, comic book creators when it comes to like connecting children to literature. Um, and I don't know how he created a formula that could do that, but <laughs> I feel like everybody could if they <laughs> found one. Uh, but um, so. The next thing that I kind of want to kind of want to segue into is is this, um, and I and I kind of notated it in in the in the outline for the format for tonight. But but this idea of like, how do you start? Like a lot of our viewers, you know, all of us. I can see everybody here reads comics. Like all of us have like this connection to comics in some deep and meaningful way. And I always think about um, one of my friends like just has a hard time knowing where to start. In fact, my girlfriend has a, had a hard time knowing where to start, and I feel like we all have people in our lives who are like, we don't understand how you got so in love with this thing. Um, and I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about where people can start now, um, but more so, what's the challenges to starting now as opposed to when we were all very young. Um, so let's start with, uh, I want to I want to hear from Michael uh, really quickly um, and him talking about his experiences with kids actually starting reading comics and, and how that goes and what works and 
Yeah, well, uh, truth be told, most of the kids that we work with in the comic book project never thought of themselves as comics readers. So the project is oftentimes their first introduction to what a comic is. And what's interesting about it is that, therefore, the first comics that they wind up reading are other kids' comics, because that's what we do in the comic book project, which is kind of a neat thing because um, you get to hear a voice from another kid and you get to... Um, sort of experience what another young person is thinking about and drawing about. So it might be a very different entry than a real um, you know, hardcore comics fan, but we've seen it happen over and over again where the kid sort of dips their little toe into the project and all of a sudden they're, you know, reading manga voraciously and now they're off into, you know, the whole Marvel universe. So I think there's no real one answer to this. Um, it's a really beautiful thing, though, when we start to see kids who you know, never thought of themselves as readers and are suddenly just consuming volumes and volumes, volumes and volumes of comics. Um, it can be a really beautiful thing and something I think that the education world is starting to think about but um, needs to embrace in a more sort of holistic and um, uh, comprehensive way. So I, I think that that answer is probably different from what others might say, but we've seen it happen with the comic book project several times where kids just fall in love with comics right away. That's a pretty punk rock way to uh, to get into comics, though, is like, I never saw a comic. I just, like, read a comic that the guy next to me made. Like, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome, though. Um, uh, I'm interested in hearing from um, uh, Meg uh, uh, where, you know, um, thinking about that question of, like, what are some of the options? of getting into comics, but also, like, where do you people get into comics for you? Like, what is the go-to for that? Well, I think the hardest obstacle is the fact that you only find comics in comic stores. Um, and I never saw a comic shop up until college. Like, at, they didn't exist. Um, which is unfortunate, because... I guess you can find manga in bookstores now, which is great uh, if that's what you want. But like independent comics, like Kate Books, all that stuff, uh, there's this huge barrier of just location. So, I mean, I was exposed to comics over and over and over again, but because they weren't... I mean, like, you're not going to get someone who's into fantasy to be hardcore into, like, historical fiction. You need to find the thing that would appeal to the person. And comics, it covers all of that, but people don't know that it covers all of that. So the biggest obstacle that I can see is just basic exposure. Um, Shane, you've worked on a lot of uh, all ages material, um, and we did a panel on that last summer, actually. But but this idea of um, creating comics for all ages, uh, what? And you've toured a lot as well, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in hearing from your point of view, like what works to get people into comics. Um, I think. Uh, anybody can get into comics because the cool thing about now is there's something available for everybody in the medium of comics. Um, kind of when it was getting started and for a lot of the time it's just been superheroes um, and that's not everybody's cup of tea. But now it is a really cool time because you have a lot of small publishers and indie publishers or even just creators who publish directly to the web um, and you know they don't need a publisher and there's all these different ways to get your entertainment now that you can go online and find comics or you can go to the traditional comic shops. Um, I do miss the days when you could go into a grocery store and find comics because that's how I got into them. Uh, but there's still, you have to be a little craftier about it, but there's ways. Um, and I do, a lot, I meet a lot of people at comic conventions, uh, which are always really cool to, to get out and see exactly who's reading comics. And uh, for a lot of the stuff that my brother and I have done, we find that our audience is not who we thought it was. We found out we have like this really big kind of middle-aged woman um, audience for Reed Gunther, which is amazing because we thought of it, it's a very like high adventure, lots of danger, monsters, like mustaches. Uh, and there's there was these like basically moms coming up to us and they're like, 
well, my son got your book, and he loved it, and I always have to take peeks, see what he's into. And she's like, and I read the whole thing, and I absolutely loved it. And we were blown away. We're like, wow, what a, that's so cool. Like, we never thought you would be our audience. But um, I think that's the thing with all ages books, specifically all ages books, uh, if they truly are all ages. That doesn't mean kids or just for kids. It means anybody who enjoys, you know, comedy or adventure or, like, fun. Like, that's the, Chris and I are always pitching books, and we're like, oh, it's just really fun. And it's the worst thing to pitch somebody because they're like, yeah, it's all supposed to be fun, right? Uh, but I think that's the, the truly the thing that, like, if you can make something that is so much fun for people to read, like Calvin and Hobbes, that's something that is just, like, it transcends fun with just how amazing it is. Uh, so I think that's the ultimate goal people can work towards. And it doesn't mean, like, you're not talking down to your audience of kids. Uh, I think that's what stretches it into the realm of all ages. It's funny, um, Alonzo and I actually did a uh, comic book release party on Friday night, and it was a big, long event for our, the first chapter of our comic, American Boom. But what was really funny was we hosted it in a comic book store, and I found myself selling like a ton of the comics that were on the racks that weren't ours. Like, two people that came to the party, I'm like, oh, you have to check out, you know, um, uh, Hickman's new run on the, the Fantastic Four, and it's amazing. And someone's like, what's a good Wolverine? I'm like, well, there's a lot of good Wolverine, you know, like, and I'm just kind of selling it all over the place. Um, Alonzo, uh, I know uh, at the studio we have this big library. Um, I'm kind of interested in what your tactics are for getting new comic book, because we have a lot of young students that come in, and what are some of the tactics you use to get them reading? Well, um, I think kind of echoing what um, I think it was Meg was talking about, it's, you know, it's, Comics kind of does everything well, or can do everything well, and it's about finding the the right material for a particular person. Um, so I feel like the you know we have students come in and you know sign up for classes and they start taking classes and they want to know what they should be reading, uh, what they'd like, um, and you know I, I feel like I am good enough at reading their personality that if someone's into kind of seems like a kind of classic teenager and they want action. Lately I've been pushing Jack Kirby's fourth world stuff. Um, that stuff is phenomenal and mythic and epic, but totally street level at the same time. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, I, I will always push bone on anyone between the ages of three and 120. Um, that book is amazing. Um, the Rose miniseries that ties in with that. Um, if you're a little bit older, Watchmen is good. Um, I think it tends it, it 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 you have to find stuff that is quality, right? It has to be quality to begin with. But then you can always find something to to calibrate to someone's kind of particular um, particular interest and and what draws them to um, to art in general. You know, whether that be movies or books, um, you find what hooks them in, and comics can do that. Um, you know in my humble opinion, better than just about anything. Uh, and you just pass it along. Um, so we have a couple more people uh, up here. Let's, um, did you guys have uh, Ginger, Lee, Mark, did you have anything to add to that, that conversation? Um, I, I had just a little thing. Um, in terms of finding comics uh, to read, one of the best things that I've found is find a comic that you like, especially uh, for people who are just starting out, just go on the web and look for comics. You'll, you'll find something. And then once you find something that you like, send an email to the artist. Um, just send an email to the artist, and uh, web comicers are so open, you can get anything that you want from them. And they'll tell you what they're reading, and that's a great way to, especially if you already like their stuff, to just branch out into other good things. Yeah, I'm just going to second what Mark said over here because ultimately what made me become a comic artist and writer is that there are web comics. And so there's this whole community that's great to interact with. And, you know, it made it seem like it was something that I could do on my own, that I didn't need what everybody calls the big two to get my story out there. So web comics is a great entry point, And it's free for a lot of people. So. And I'll uh, add this on the end here that I think what got me into sharing my work online was the early days of DeviantArt, and that got me used to the world of uh, creating something and then putting it out there, and then ex first experiencing like people seeing it. Because up till then, you're you're just drawing in your sketchbook through 
like junior high and high school, and uh, it's your it's your secret, it's your sketchbook, like no one sees it, or your only your best friends see it, and maybe you have another artist friend, and then you're both like raising each other up. You keep pushing the bar up, um, going back and forth with your drawing. Um, but then discovering web comics was the first time I was like, oh, it could be more than just messy pencils in a sketchbook. I can actually ink it and finish it, and then it's a finished thing. So uh, that was a kind of mind-blowing moment for me in the early 2000s, um, and then I've been making my own ever since, once that revelation hit. So it's, yeah, like, like uh, Mark said, um, just go online. I think Twitter is a fantastic way to connect to specific creators that you want to, like, because there's so many uh, professionals, amateurs, uh, do-it-yourself, indie guys, um, they're all on Twitter and Facebook, and they're uh, just send them a message, say, I love your stuff, which I've done tons of times. And they're like, well, if you like mine, you should check out this. And, uh, you know, then you've got, you're off, and there's no stopping you. Wow. Okay, so uh, we, now I'm going to launch into questions, but before I do, I was actually going to share what my favorite resource was for getting people into comics, because my new favorite one, the 21st century one, um, I don't know if you guys have been, but I am completely addicted to um, Comixology on my uh, my iPad. Like, I just, I love reading comics on my iPad. I, I got it for my birthday last summer. I would never usually buy Apple products, but um, I love having an Apple product. It's kind of a... <laughs> um, but, uh, like, I, w what I really love about it is the uh, the panel-to-panel -panel thing. Um, in fact, Alonzo and I have been working on that for our webcomic, American Boom. Um, but theirs on the iPad is really cool because you're able to uh, just kind of flip through the panels. Um, right now, now I'm reading uh, Strangers in Paradise for the um, upcoming gender studies MOOC free open online MOOC class by Ball State University. Um, I got their syllabus and I was like, oh, all the homeworks, reading comics, awesome. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of like going through that. Um, but one of the questions from Paul Christopher um, on our Google Plus page was, do you feel apps like Comixology have helped bridge the distance um, from a comic shop uh, issue that Meg kind of mentioned, and I do, I do think that they've done a lot. I think having a centralized store, they advertise themselves as the largest comic book store in the world, um, and I still wish they had more titles, but they're working on that. So um, does anybody else uh, have any opinions on Comixology or uh, whether, whether it's helped or hindered or what have you? You just throw it out there. Nobody? Okay. Um, we're going to go to some more questions from... Uh, Ginger asked a bunch more questions. Um, got a bunch more questions from her fans. Um, uh, Cameron asked, uh, why comics as a form of storytelling rather than some other form of storytelling? So why, why comics? Why did we choose comics for those storytellers on the panel as opposed to... Uh, prose or uh, children's books or other literature of that sort. Um, let's go with uh, Mark. Um, I, 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 I connect with comics in a way that I don't connect with any other um, visual form of storytelling. Uh, there's things that you can get from the pacing between the panels that's just... Uh, it's a strange mix between film and literature and the, the pacing that you get. Um, for example, something like, uh, I'm going to rip out this book here. Um, this right here is a calendar, but it's also a comic. Um, it's by Chris Ware. Um, just the way that he's put this together, um, you get these silent interactions between characters and it's this like soul crushing depression and beauty all wrapped into one. And then, um, I haven't found any other medium that can replicate the ability to kind of transmit that uh, human emotion to other people. Um, for me, that's why comics is the medium of choice. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Ginger, you uh, got the question, so do you have an answer to it? Well, uh, I would say, first of all, that I'm an illustrator, so I just really enjoy illustrating things, but... Um, 
I'm kind of, I'm probably going to mirror what Mark just said as well, is that there's, there's silences and pauses that you could put in a comic that you can't put, or that, you know, that the reader gets to insert. It's very interactive form of storytelling, is that the reader reads it at their own pace, but then also the artist is kind of trying to move um, the message along with it. So as a graphic designer, a lot of what my job is is to communicate things and pace things, and so um, rather than performing it through movie or, or prose, um, I prefer to do it with comics because it just kind of fires those cylinders that I have in my professional job. Um, let's go with uh, Lee. Why comics? Let's see. Comics, why? <laughs> Uh, they're just some like uh, like I, I love the what Ginger pointed out that um, the reader is in control of the pacing and that's something you can't get out of a movie uh, because the editor's in control of that pacing and the director's in control there and what I found so uh, interesting about creating comics is that you are writer director uh, producer editor um, you're the special effects guy you're the sound guy, you're, you're everything, all that would, would be so many different jobs on a TV show or a movie uh, you, is all wrapped into one and you get to pull every string as you're uh, creating your own. And for me, um, I don't know if I would be as big of a comic fan as I am if I wasn't creating my own. Um, that's probably a majority of the interest in it for me is like, that is awesome. I'm going to use that, and I'm going to do that right now. And then if I wasn't doing it, then... I mean, I read a lot of uh, uh, sci-fi and fantasy and just, like, genre fiction and uh, listen to podcasts, and I consume all kinds of other media, but comics is the only one that inspires me to do it myself. And that's not just because I have an artistic background um, drawn ever since I could hold a crayon. It's just there's something about it that sucks you in and makes you want to participate. And, uh, and I think... It's just such an immersive medium that, you know, I can't help but do it. It's like, I don't have a choice. <laughs> um, I found out recently that I uh, might have been farsighted from when I was uh, very young. Um, and my, my eye doctor was like, do you kind of hate reading? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, have a, I like don't like reading, like, like novels. And he... Um, and he said, uh, you know, that's that's pretty common for people who are farsighted. So potentially, I, I also believe that comic books maybe have been a way to deal with, you know, not being able to, to, to read as fluidly. Michael, you, you deal with a lot. Like, you've probably done the most research on, on why reading comics is a good idea um, out of all of us. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it's, uh, that point that you just made about uh, struggling readers, and that could be for a variety of reasons, Maybe they're new to the English language, or they just don't like reading, like you, you know, might have been your case. There's this bridge that comics seem to be able to make to other kinds of literature, and just reconnecting to learning in general. And the other thing that I have to say about it is that when kids create their own comics, because they're going to be published and exhibited, suddenly the kids really care about commas and spelling and punctuation and things that, you know, if a teacher presented those things on the traditional worksheet, everybody would groan, you know, like another commas worksheet. But in the context of your own comic book that's going to be seen and published, now kids start to care about those things. And that makes writing all the more enjoyable. And it goes the same for reading. So there's a power there that is just beginning to be tapped by educators. And I think, I think, Part of the disconnect in the classroom is so many English teachers, and I could say this for myself as well, you know, grew up as readers. They grew up as reading, you know, books that they loved and the classics and so on. And when their kids aren't there or aren't in that space, it's hard for a teacher who didn't grow up reading comics to say, well, okay, I'm going to use graphic novels or comics to be able to make that connection. But I think it's happening more and more. And when we see how many kids just embrace these um, works of literature and when classrooms and teachers start to consider comics as literature, that's when really amazing things can start to happen. 
So thinking about uh, how important commas are professionally, I was going to ask uh, Shane what he thought. Uh, <laughs> thought uh, in that transition of becoming a professional, you know, looking back, um, uh, how would you have dealt with, uh, what would you have told yourself as a younger version of yourself? Um, getting into it. It's what, I, what I would have told myself um, on how to get into comics? Or like what, well, not into comics. Because I'd, like I'd it, say you're doing a good job because you get there. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know what you're doing. <laughs> Keep um, going. But I mean, like, in the sense of um, um, when if we were talking to younger, what do you tell younger readers of yours who are like come up to you at a con and say like, how do I do this professionally? Okay, so the the key thing is to just do it and don't stop. Um, everything that I've seen is like you just have to be. It's all. Repetition, practice makes perfect. It's, it's just like what they tell you if you're trying to become a musician or anything else. If you want to be good at it, you just have to keep doing it until you make it work. Uh, the first comic I wrote is uh, so it's not as good as the stuff I do now. Um, and it's because I learned from every script I write on how to get better. And it's all little things. And I think there's things you just kind of have to learn as you go along and the only way you can learn those things is just by doing it so uh, sometimes I'll meet people at conventions who want to start writing comics uh, but they always tell me like oh but I can't draw so I'm just going to submit my scripts to publishers and hope it it works um, from what I've seen like that's the comic industry is so small as is like there's enough writers uh, and I ha I don't think I've ever met anybody who's just submitted their script to a publisher and is now a writer uh, for comics at least and so the main thing is, like, you have to figure out a way to do it yourself. Uh, Ryan North is a uh, writer. He writes the Adventure Time comic now, and he's had a webcomic called Dinosaur Comics, and it's been out for, like, nine years or something crazy long. Uh, and the funny thing about Dinosaur Comics is the art never changes. He has one thing. It's all, like, uh, clip art of these dinosaurs, and they, it's exactly the same. For, like, nine years, the same comic. But he changes the words every time, and it's hilarious. Uh, and that's how he has kind of grown to become this uh, writer, and he's, um, he's gotten very successful because of that, because that was his own thing that he did himself, put it online. He can't draw, but uh, he, he found ways around it. Um, so if you can't draw, find ways around it. Find an artist like my brother. So basically have your parents get working on that and then train him to draw. And then, um, and then boof, you're a writer. It's that easy. Um, that's, it's, it's very interesting to, to hear the, the advice of like, just keep working because I, I know that Malcolm Gladwell research of, uh, like 10,000 hours until you're a master. Um, I heard, um, another artist, I can't remember, Alex, Alec Longstreth of phase seven, um, works for the center for cartoon studies. And he said it was around 2000 pages of comic creation, um, full and that's your 10,000 hours. Um, uh, I was interested, um, not to just hone back in on Michael, but I kind of was interested. Are there studies out there that, that, that show that reading comics is good for you? Uh, yes, there are uh, definitely studies that uh, show that uh, comics have a higher level of vocabulary than not only children's books, that makes sense, but uh, than television shows or even adult conversations. And um, there's a good amount of evidence that comics... Um, are an excellent bridge to traditional literacy skills, both in terms of sequencing, in terms of um, grammar, and not just you know traditional grammar, but syntax and uh, sentence formation, and even uh, motivationally in terms of just wanting to read. So the evidence is growing. Um, we need to do more of it. Um, academics out there in the literacy field need to um, you know, develop more um, sort of rigorous uh, measures of these things, but the evidence is there and it's growing. And, um, and I also think in the world of education, we also have to think about things that make sense. And when a young person is sitting there consuming book after book after book, it's, there's your evidence. I mean, it's working. So um, comics have an incredible power and, and the research is starting to show that.
Sorry for that lag. Um, I was going to ask uh, Chris Ludden, I'm guessing is related to uh, Ginger Ludden, <laughs> but maybe not. They could be completely unrelated people. Oh, he's uh, my husband. Oh. <laughs> it would have been... Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so I was. he, he asked... Um, there was a lot of comics mentioned in the background segment, which there were. I noticed there was like a ton of comics mentioned. But... But is there like one comic that you would recommend um, as an entry point? And I was thinking about this question before I before we we went to answer it. Uh, and I asked, I want to ask you guys what you think about it. I think it's completely different for for all reading levels. Um, so maybe we could kind of cover like. It, before we answer this, as because I feel like we're all going to be like, it's Kelvin and Hobbes. That's obviously the entry point. Like, and it, it is. It really is the entry point. Or Bone, one of the two. Like, you know, pick. But uh, but let's talk about different um, different age age groups and different uh, different people and where their entry point might be and what what our one thing of suggestion. So um, let's let's play this game right now. Uh, so we'll go across and, and don't repeat a comic. Don't do that. Um, let's just give a, a distinct list of one per person that, that kind of exemplify comics to us and, and where those entry points would be. Um, and let's start with Alonzo. Sandman. So that hands down, Sandman. Yeah, I think so. I, are we doing one? I am confused. Just one. The rules. <laughs> Just one. You you can you can um you can say why briefly. Um, I think Sandman because I find it, it's the book I was pushing on people when I was in high school and then in college, and it's one that I still continue to push on people as an adult um, to peers. So I think it actually has a bone is a fantastic entry point. I feel like for middle schoolers and high schoolers, I feel like Sandman's shelf life, as it were, extends well into adulthood. Uh, Ginger. I'm also recommending Bone, but since I gotta pick a different one, let me pick up this. This is a book called Asteros Pollock. I would say that it's probably a good entry point for um, adults that don't understand comics. Because it's an adult story, I wouldn't recommend it to kids. But um, if you are, I recommend it to a lot of my friends and graphic designers and, you know, sculpture artists that don't understand what comics is or why this is important because it's just very well told. Lee? Um... Darn, I was going to say Bone, but that's the easy way out. Let's go with Cardboard by Doug Tenapel. Um Doug's been a, a huge influence and inspiration for me since, uh, <laughs> for many, many years, ever since I saw the Neverhood video game and uh, his Earthworm Jim stuff and then into his graphic novels. And he puts out so many graphic novels, like more than one a year, it feels like. And he's branching out into webcomics now stuff. So I always recommend Doug. Um, and you can pretty much pick up any one of his books. They're all fantastic and uh, so accessible. They're really easy to like and get into because uh, the art is simple but very expressive. Um, it doesn't, it's not, you won't look at it and go, I don't know what's going on. It's too confusing or too small and detailed. It's big and bold and uh, just really good starting point, I think. Um, I would recommend Essex County. Uh, I just actually read it uh, last week, um, and it is absolutely brilliant. It's the the story is on a uh, the story is on a high literary level, um, where I think people who are fans of classic literature would still really really dig this book. And um, the art has a beautiful quality to it that that's at the same time really skilled and also kind of crude. So someone who maybe doesn't feel super talented at art could look at it and still kind of feel like they could pick it up and, and work on it. So Essex County all the way. I love Essex County. It's a great book. Um, Meg, what's your... Well, my husband actually works at a comic shop, and the number one book I think that he ends up handing out is Blankets by Craig Thompson. And he's sassing me from the corner now. Um, but uh, Blankets is, it's, well, it's a love story. So, like, if you've got a girlfriend or somebody who that you want to get into comics, 
and you're not sure, like, if she hasn't read Sandman and hates fantasy or whatever else, uh, Blankets is a really beautiful book. I was actually going to say Blankets, um, so so now I get to go with my plan B. I'm so glad that you were able to, to say it instead of me. Craig Thompson is probably one of the most amazing comic creators of this this generation. Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael. Uh, just very quickly, um, the one comic that has made its way into classrooms all around the country is, is Mouse, and so if there are educators out there who are thinking about, well, where do I begin, I would begin there. Um, because there are tons of lesson plans out there, and it's a great connection to history. And I also just have to put a plug in for, I don't know if you call it a comic, but I love Eric Drucker. Um, I love this book, Flood. Um, it's a wordless book, so I don't know if you call it a comic, but um, it's a really beautiful book of sequential art. Uh, and Shane, you're going to go next. Uh, I had some friends over last night, and uh, I found out that my friend's wife had never read a comic book before, and so I took her over to my shelf full of comics, and I pulled out uh, the first trade of Why the Last Man. Uh, Why the Last Man is Brian K. Vaughn's, uh, like, epic uh, post-apocalyptic adventure. It's about uh, all the men in the world, every one of them dies, uh, something to do with their Y chromosome. And so it's just women except for this one guy, Yurik, and his pet monkey, who are the last two male anything on the world. And it's a great place to get into because it's, like, it's full of adventure, it's exciting, it's like very engaging and very uh, horrifying but fun. Uh, it's definitely something more for adults, and uh, that's the one I always like to start people on, whether, it's, whether they're male or female, I feel like the audience for that book is just through the roof, uh, just with loving fans. It's very cool. Why the Last Man is definitely of the, the top, top quality, especially because of the, last, the first name of the uh, main character there. Um, but my, uh, my favorite, the one that I'm going to throw out there, because everybody threw out the one, you know, I got to, first, before I tell you what mine is, I'm so happy to hear and be on a panel on a Monday night and hear, like, everybody's favorite comics are some of my favorite comics. And, and that's, it's just cool to be in a room well, virtual room of people that are like, hey, you're awesome, because we're awesome. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, but my favorite comic is uh, The uh, uh, Preacher, uh, volumes one through nine by Garth Ennis. And, and, and I, I share that to anybody over 18. I, I hesitate to share it to my high school students because I don't want to get fired, but um, it is probably, like, I always consider, like, Watchmen and Preacher, the oscillating Beatles and Led Zeppelin of my... Uh, my queue of favorite comics, but Preacher is, um, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, and, and, and it, the character development is amazing. The premise should not work. Nothing about the premise of Preacher should work, but it does, and um, it, it's, it goes uh, through these nine volumes because I'm hooked to these characters, much in a very similar way to Why the Last Man, um, and you just become uh, completely overwhelmed by how amazing the book is. So we have like two minutes left of this. I can't believe an hour's gone by this fast. Um, but, uh, and we didn't get through all of the questions, but I wanted to know if anybody had any last thoughts before we, before we leave to kind of aid potentially teachers who are watching this, students who are watching this, maybe a little piece of advice on, um, on, on what, what can be done to improve this literacy, improve um, reading, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, for, for students who are uh, into this stuff, I would say read a comic or start a comic every single day. For students who are trying to uh, um, draw this stuff, just draw something every day. Um, give it five minutes, just something. It's amazing the snowball effect that that'll give you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just give a shout out to all other comic creators, or at least most of the ones I've interacted with, but just been uh, the best community of peers that I could have hoped for in my uh, chosen <laughs> life path for whatever I want to do for the rest of my life. And they've been some of the most welcoming and supportive and enthusiastic people that you'll ever meet are uh, other people who make comics. So uh, 
make comics and join us. It's a big party. Um, we're actually out of time. Um, that was amazing, everybody. We, I had a really great time um, listening to everybody share. We need to definitely do this again. Um, uh, let's just plug all of our stuff so people know where to know where to look to get some quality things. Um, and I'll start by saying read American Boom at American B triple O M dot U S. It's free and awesome and online, and I created it with Alonzo, um, so so you can read it. Um, go through and plug all your stuff, and then we'll we'll sign out. Uh, all right, since Patrick got um, our comic, I'm going to plug our uh, summer camps that we have coming up. Um, in particular, um, if you go to www.lilfish.us, um, all our summer camps are there. Um, I am excited to announce that we have one coming up right around Comic-Con featuring Klaus Janssen, um, which is going to rock hard. I'm super excited. And my comic is uh, The Brothers Grant. You can find it at thebrothersgrant.com and check it out. And you can find my work at littleguardianscomic.com and then Facebook and Twitter and G Plus and Tumblr and anywhere else. <laughs> just, uh, just Google search Little Guardians and it's there. Uh, you can find me at uh, 2816monument.com. Uh, it's the comic I do. And uh, if you find me in any of the social stuff, the main ones, I do uh, drawings every day. So maybe you can pick up on this. They're fun. Oh, it's my turn, isn't it? Um, just Google Godsend webcomic. It's, it's fantasy. People die in it. <laughs> Mike. Okay, and uh, you can visit the comic book project at edpath.org, and you can see a bunch of comics that kids have made over the last 10 years, and you can also support a comic book project in your neighborhood if you want to get one going. And Shane? Um, got these awesome Reed Gunther books on <laughs> Amazon.com. They're in... Uh, bookstores and comic shops. I also write Fanboys vs. Zombies, which comes out monthly. And also this summer, I've got a bunch of Bart Simpson stories in the Bart Simpson title, and also an issue in the Simpsons comics in September, I believe. So uh, I'm also at Comic-Con, so if you see me, uh, swing by. Say hi. I, too, will be at Comic-Con uh, this year with you, uh, Shane, as well as Alonzo. Um, so... Have, this is awesome. We had a great time. Keep checking out the Little Fish uh, Studio uh, Google Plus page to continue to see more um, more events like these that we're putting on. And I had a great time. And thanks for Google for all the help. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, and have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>